Expatriation. Has anyone here ever worked with expatriation clients? People are renouncing citizenship? You? Okay, a couple. Um, so this is what I was talking about earlier of the dual status return. So that's only for those who are no longer permanent residents or citizens during the year. And for those who meet the substantial presence test, you have to still file a full year resident return. But that's not, that's not always true for when you're actually renouncing U.S. citizenship or green card. Then it's the date that you renounced it, and it's the 1040 and or afterwards. So it's a little different for when you leave for the, um, for the expatriation than, than it is for expatriation. Um, so they're both the part of your form, and it's, the, it's really important. I see this as an error all the time from returns I supervise, that for the dual status, that people don't put the dates at the top of the return that the part year is for. And if you don't have the dates in there, obviously your software can't calculate everything. And when you have a, when you have a dual status and you're ending your residency, a lot, of, uh, a lot of things come through, like all your passive losses come through, you know, all your depreciation is recalculated, it's like an ending point for that residency. So, you have to really make sure you're, soft, you're working with your software because you can't, uh, calculating all that on your own is very tedious. But you also have to know kind of what, what to expect, I think, from it a little bit so you can make sure the software is doing it right. Because as we all know, software doesn't always calculate everything correctly. I'm sure we've all run into that. Um, then it's important to put a header on the top of each, the very top of each return that says dual status return, dual status statement. I know this stuff sounds obvious, but I see people doing it wrong all the time. Important to mention. Um, so expatriation tax. Um, for those of you who have worked with expatriation clients, you've probably seen that as worried as they are, even if were they covered expatriates or non-covered that you've worked with? No, you don't know. Okay. Does anyone know the difference between a covered and non-covered expatriate? Okay, covered, uh, non-covered expatriates are if you've had less than a certain amount of income in each of, or taxable liability in the last, you know, bunch of years, so taxable income where it comes down on, you know, the end of the 1040 and it measures your taxable income. I think they've raised it, at, where the new numbers came out the other day, I think it was 168,000, it was like 163,000 the year before. And then for assets, it's a $2 million mark, that if you have more than $2 million in assets. So if you're over those two marks, you become what's considered a covered expatriate. And then you have to go through, it's a little bit more complicated on um, you know, 8850 when you fill out your expatriation form, and you have to go through and fill out all of your, your balance sheets, show everything for the covered expatriates, that you don't have to do for the non-covered. But most of the time, even a covered expatriate, you don't end up with an expatriation tax because there's a ex uh, exclusion for, um, for the tax that reduces any tax that would be calculated by $680,000. So, I mean, out of, out of all the expatriation cases I've handled, I've only seen, I think, two where they had to pay any kind of expatriation tax. And they were very, very high asset amounts. And so, so what it is, though, is then when you're leaving, the way they calculate the tax is everything is set up in a mark-to-market method. So your, um, you know, your fair market value and then whatever your basis is and that amount in between is what you're taxed on. So it's as if you liquidated and sold every investment and absolutely everything you own on the day you expatriated. So that, that's, the way, that's the way they calculate it, is based on that mark-to-market. Uh, the reason this is a big problem for non-residents is that if you cease to be a resident, and then within the next three-year period come back and become a resident, they deem that everything you owned when you ceased your residency before should be mark-to-market, and you owe tax then on all your investment assets. Oh yeah. 
<laughs> or just, yeah, I'd say, but I mean, I'd say it's really important if you have clients who have been residents and they're leaving and becoming a non-resident that you say, you know, you can't come be a resident for another three years or you risk this, uh, this big issue. And it's actually calculated on either the mark to market or a 30% flat tax, whichever is higher. So it's actually even tougher than the expatriation loss. So that's why I think it's really important to understand a little bit about the expatriation, how this is calculated, so people don't think. The asset value went down. They still have to pay 30% of the asset value when they come back or not. I don't think so. I think if the assets went down, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that. But then they're also, in the period, in the interim period, deemed residents. So they would have to file amended returns. Like, say, say yeah, let's say, like, you know, somebody expatriated in 2012 and then they moved back this year and they say hey I'm back in the US I'm here to be your client again should I, should I come in and file my 2000 you know 2016 for my 2015 you know then you're gonna have to not only calculate all the expatriation tax but their tax returns then for 2013 I mean if they filed a dual status in 2012 or 2012 automatically becomes full year so it needs an amended for that and then their 2013 and their 2014 plus their 2015 that they were resident in. And then you have to do the 8858 and all the, you know, expatriation tax based on based on their assets. So you should just tell them to go away. It's too late at that point, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean it depends if they've met the substantial presence test or not, you know. If they haven't, if they've only been back a couple months, they haven't met it yet. You know, <laughs> yeah, get get out of here. You know, it's uh, serious. Seriously, I mean, it's that could be a very expensive proposition, and people don't know about that, and we as a group don't necessarily know to be able to advise our clients to that they that they could get into trouble on that. That's the kind of thing where you know you file the resident return again, the IRS, the little computer goes bing bing bing, and then. Here's somebody who should have been filing resident returns. Where's their resident returns the last two years? 